Bring a Bible to God's house this morning. I'm going to do more along the lines of teaching uh, than preaching. Maybe for the next several Sundays. I know I'm not even going to try to get this done in one sermon. Because I want those of you who have never heard this, do not know what it's about. Uh, I want you to understand this. Uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, if you would, please. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I'll never forget, I was uh, sitting out on a deer stand one year and had my Bible there, opening day of deer season. I think uh, three deer run by my way while I was reading the Bible, and I didn't pay no attention to it whatsoever. But I remember opening my Bible up to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And the very first uh, sentence there, it says, the words of the preacher. Let me get to it. And I noticed that that capital P in preacher, where is Ecclesiastes at? I got it. I got it. Notice that it says the words of the preacher, capital P. And that's all I read for a while. I stopped right there and I pondered that. And I went, it's capital P. That means the preacher is Jesus Christ. Amen. And then it occurred to me that in all the church services I've conducted, in all the sermons that I've preached, all the lessons I taught, all the videos I've made, the real preacher wasn't me. The real preacher behind the scenes was Jesus Christ. If Jesus does not preach and teach you today, you'll get nothing out of what I'm going to share with you this morning. You'll get nothing out of it. It will be good for nothing. And what happens to things that are good for nothing in the Bible? They're to be cast out trodden under the feet of men like the salt of the earth is, that the salt has lost its savor, it is therefore good for nothing to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. So just that one phrase there had me tied up in thoughts and, and tears and, and looking at other scriptures just because it dawned on me that I'm only a stand-in Call it a stunt double. I'm only a stand-in for the real preacher here today, and that's Jesus Christ. You want him here more than me. Say amen. amen. One day, I was in the auditorium here during a weekday, and I was really, really, really down. And... Um, I think a lot of it, I was just beating myself up. And um, I was making my complaint to God. And basically telling God, God, I don't see how I'm going to make it. I don't, I don't see how in the world I'm going to be able to accomplish anything in the ministry. Surely, God, you made a mistake. The Holy Ghost reminded me of the passage of Scripture that says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And I thought about that for a while. And what it meant to me at the time was if God called me, then He knew exactly what He was getting when He called me. Nothing that I've ever done am doing now or will do in the future is a mystery to God. He knows it all. And if I'm truly called of God, and that, I guess that would be up to God and up to you fine people. But if I'm truly called of God, then God did not make a mistake. But that left me with all kinds of questions. God, how come on some days, 
fighting the devil is not only easy, it's fun. And um, I love taking target practice on the devil. Amen? Some days it's fun. Some days walking with God, talking with God, communing with God is sweet. But some days it's almost non-existent. Almost. And I didn't understand it. I had, I had no clue. My, my impression, I've, I've told this before, but my impression... It's like I mentioned, uh, Brother Tim here, his grandmother was Sister Hazel Waymeyer. And the Waymeyers and, and all of those other adults, as I was growing up in this church, I thought those were the greatest saints that ever lived. I had a very high opinion of all of the adults that were in the church at the time. And then I remember one time, one of, one of the guys, I've mentioned this before too, he was my Sunday school teacher. All of a sudden, he didn't show up at church anymore. And I didn't understand that. What happened? I found out by, just by listening to people talk that uh, this particular man just gave up, walked out, went back to his old lifestyle, cheating on his wife, drinking. And eventually was killed in a car accident on a foggy night on 110 Highway, drunk as could be. They found parts of him in the back seat. That's how violent the wreck was. Another, one of my Sunday, what do I do? What do I do to Sunday school teachers? Another of my Sunday school teachers didn't have it so violent, but he also quit coming to church then eventually quit coming home to his wife and kids. And he stayed that way. I don't know if he's dead or alive right now. But to my knowledge, he stayed that way. So I started seeing these adults in the church. Number one, turning away from God. Then a few years later, I'm watching them turn on each other in this church. Uh, I'm, then I was a teenager and... Uh, was visiting a man that uh, him and his wife and children started coming to church here. And and uh, he was a very talented man. He could sing and so on. And, and um, then he dropped out of church. I didn't really understand why. He ended up uh, with some kind of sickness and had to stay in the hospital. And I remember me and the preacher went over to see him. And there on his little table that they give you in the hospital while you're laying in bed... He had a copy of Playboy magazine there. And I just went, what are you doing? And then I grew up and found out that as an adult, trying to live a testimony in front of others, trying to live as you're seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and letting all these other things uh, come to you by the blessing of God, I found out why some of these guys left, why some of these ladies left, why some people just don't act the Christian that they ought to, why some people just fall out. But while I was there on the altar praying, I remember God spoke softly to me and said, Mike, everything goes in cycles. I had to ponder that for a while. I had to think about that for a while. And I have you there in Ecclesiastes. I want you to look at verse 4. Again, this was written by Solomon. But it was inspired by Jesus himself. And I want you to notice on verse 4. Solomon says, One generation passeth away and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. And I mean, that sounds simple, but it's true. Old folks, they die off. Young folks come along. Within about 50 years, those young folks have become old folks. They die off. Another generation comes up. And it's been doing that ever since God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And ever since they had children, 
It's been going exactly that way. In fact, if you were to look at Genesis 5, you're going to see that same pattern. One generation cometh and another passeth the way. So when Adam died, Adam didn't just die with no, um, no progeny left. He had numerous sons and daughters. And the Bible mentions, of course, Seth. Then before Seth dies away, uh, Seth has numerous sons and daughters uh, and so on. And then his son had sons and daughters. And then his son had sons and daughters and so on and so on and so on. And that cycle just keeps going and going all throughout. Everybody in this room is a son of Adam. Somehow, some way, you're a child of Adam and Eve. Amen? So whatever existed in Adam and Eve some 6,000 years ago is still present to this day. It doesn't change. One generation passeth away, another ge generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. But think about the earth. The earth turns every day uh, on its axis. But also, the earth turns around the sun once every year. And it's been doing that ever since God created the heaven and the earth and he created the stars. It's been doing that ever since. So then he says, verse 5, the sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down. I just referred to that and hasteth to his place where he rose. They can predict. That's what a farmer's almanac will do for you. If you get a farmer's almanac, you can look ahead and find out what time daylight's going to be on October 17th. You can find out what time sunset's going to be uh, opening day of deer season. You can find that out because it works. In fact, to say it works like clockwork is kind of a misnomer. The clocks are based on the sun, not the other way around. It's the sun and the motion of the earth around the sun that gives us years. It's the sun and the turning of the earth once a day, every day that gives us our hours and our minutes and our seconds. And it's the moon going around the earth in its time that gives us the months. It's not that they were designed after the clock. We designed the clocks after them. Amen. I'd say God's done a pretty good job with his timekeeping. Amen. So anyway, verse 6, the wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually. What am I, what am I drawing up here? Circle. The uh, wind returneth again to his circuits. That's another word for circle. All the rivers. Now here it is. Because one day I was sitting out at St. Francis State Park. And I just kind of got alone for a couple of days. Camped out out there and I went out there in the woods on one of the trails. And I just sat and I watched that river run. And I'm watching this and I'm just, I'm praying, I'm crying, you know. Just kind of letting God have everything that I care about. And then the Holy Ghost says, Mike, watch that river. So I just, God had been watching the river ever since I sat here. And he said, where, where is it going? And I knew what God meant by that. I said, it's going down. Water runs down. And eventually, uh, what is that there? The big river? St. Francis Park, big river? Big river runs in, I think, to the Merrimack. The Merrimack runs into the Mississippi. The Mississippi runs into the Gulf of Mexico. What happens to the water after that? So all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. And I remembered that well, I'm sitting out there. In fact, I probably had my Bible and opened it up to Ecclesiastes. And the Holy Ghost is saying, Mike, it's going down. And it's getting lower all the time, isn't it? And I said, yeah. Said, Mike, that's you. I'm going to take you down and I'm going to bring you down. And then when the time is right, I'm going to pick you back up again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Father, I ask your blessings now upon this sermon, this message, this teaching. And pray, Father, that what I say falls totally in line with the scriptures. That I not stray from the word of God. But Father, you saved my life that day. You saved me from the thoughts that the devil was trying to plant in my mind. You saved me. You showed me something that I never thought of before. I never saw it before. No one had ever taught me that, God, but I learned it from you. And I thank you for it. It's, it has saved me in multiple ways. And Father Lord, if there's someone here today who's struggling, maybe... Maybe at one time a few weeks ago or a month ago that they were just living on cloud nine with you. They were just walking and talking with Jesus all day long, but something happened. And they found themselves not praying very much, not reading the word of God, not giving attendance to the scriptures. And they... The devil has told them, you're not saved, you're not born again, there's no chance for you, you might as well give up and quit right now. But Father, Lord, as you did with me, Lord, would you teach each and every one who hears my voice this morning, God, that there's no need to quit. There's, no, uh, there's nothing better out there for us than this. And teach us all, Father, that there will be highs and lows in life, but it's part of what life really is. Not what the name it, claim it people, not what the, uh, the gurus say that uh, you can have uh, positive things each and every day. It's not that, God. It's that you take us through cycles for the sole purpose that we can be fruitful for your kingdom. And Father, that's what I want. I don't want my life and all the things that I've done, all the work I've put into it. God, I don't want my life to end up a waste of space, a waste of breath. Father, I want it to count for something for your kingdom because of what you've done for me. Bless your word this morning. Bless it from humble lips, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Take a look up on the screen. For anybody who says that the Bible was written by a bunch of desert nomads a thousand years ago uh, or two thousand years ago, has never read it. At the time Solomon wrote this first part of Ecclesiastes, no one knew the answer to why all the rivers run into the ocean, but the ocean doesn't fill up. It doesn't get higher. It doesn't rise. How come it doesn't? No one knew how this worked, but God showed it to Solomon. The water, I'll just make it local. The water around here, uh, you've, got, uh, you've got Joachim Creek up here at uh, uh, Herky. You've got uh, uh, Platten Creek over here coming out of Festus. Uh, you've got the Merrimack up there at Arnold, and all of those got flooded last week. Amen? What happened to all that water? They ended up dumping into the Mississippi. The Mississippi then carries that water down all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. It gets mingled into the waters of the seas there in the Gulf of Mexico, and it, but it doesn't stop there. Now, there's no other bigger ocean for it to go into, so the water is there right around the tropics. You have the tropics, you have the equator, you have another tropical line. And in there, that area, the sun is at its peak, it's at its height, it's hot down there. And the, you have the sun shining down on the water and you have the wind blowing. Two things that if we were to take those to the Bible, we could rightfully see the sun being a picture of Jesus Christ, the wind being a picture of Hey, you got it. Smart fellas. I like you guys. So then anyway, the sun, Christ, the wind, the Holy Ghost, picks that water up. 
puts it in the air. And then, a few weeks later, ends up coming right back over us. Because where does all of our moisture come from? It don't come from Arizona. It comes from the Gulf of Mexico. And it comes up around Texas and Oklahoma, Kansas. And then here it comes right down I-70 or right up I-44. How does the wind know where the highways are? And it dumps water down on the ground. The ground, our ground at our house was so saturated. We had that much water sitting in the yard, didn't we, Sterling? For days, the ground was all squishy and wet and couldn't mow it. But all that water was running what direction? You're pretty smart. Down. To the creeks, the creeks at our house run down into the big river. Big river runs into Merrimack, Merrimack runs into the Mississippi and starts all over again. God's pretty smart, isn't he? He's pretty smart. Now, take a look at this. I, I want to go out, John, and, and count the rings on that tree out here. I'd like to find out how old it is. Who did? Huh? Really? What'd they come up with? 85? Oh, it's got to be older than that. 85? How old is this one here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, plus the bark, 14. About 13 or 14 years is this tree. And we know that. What are these rings on here anyway? Huh? Growth. History. That's right. If there's a forest fire, you're going to see a charred area. If there's a drought, like look in the center here. Whoops. Look in the center here. And don't worry about me taking too much time. I already know I'm going to take a lot of time to preach this. I'm telling you, God... I know I was saved in June of 1975 at church camp down in Niangua, Missouri. But that day, I don't want to say God saved me again, but God kept me by showing me this. Um, let me get a pen here. There we go. You can see... Where is it? Right here. That's the middle. And then see this little area right here? There's a very small growth ring. What would that indicate? A drought. And then after that, it looks like the weather patterns change. And this tree is getting plenty of water. Okay, All of this has a point. Turn to Psalm chapter 1. Because you are that tree. And I want you to think about this, okay? And I had, I had, I call this the cycles of Christian growth, the cycle of the saints. You can call it whatever you want to, but um, I preached this several years ago for the first time, way back in the 90s, uh, or the early 2000s, I'll say it that way. And, um, I had somebody in the church ask me, they said, does, is, does everybody have those cycles? I mean, does everybody that's saved have those cycles still? And I said, absolutely. Nobody is exempt from it. Nobody is. Asking, asking to be exempt from God's patterns and cycles in our lives would be like asking God to, um, to do away with the moon. He's not going to do that. It is His way and taking us in our life through these cycles, that's how God does His work in our lives. Now, if I were to ask you, would you like to be fruitful for the kingdom of God this morning? How many of you would raise your hand? I want that. No matter, I, no matter what else happens in my life, I want God to produce fruit in my life that is pleasing and honors God for what he's done for me. 
I can't pay God back for his salvation. But I certainly want to exhibit to a lost and dying world that Jesus really is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Amen. Psalm chapter 1, let's read this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Day, the mention of day and night is a cycle. Day and then night. Day and then night. Um, in verse 3, And he shall be like a what? This is you. This is you. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his what? When does it bring it forth? Seasons. There's only one, in the northern hemisphere, there's only one season of fruitfulness. And that is summer into fall. No other, you don't, you don't go out picking strawberries in January. You don't go out picking tomatoes for your Christmas basket. Amen? One time only per year. Is, and, and, and so if anybody, here's what I'm trying to save you from. I'm trying to save you from the world of social media and the lies that are being told on it by people. Somebody invariably is going to tell you that if you're not living for Christ and, and, and producing fruit in your life day in, day out, constantly every day, well, you're probably not really saved. You're probably not really born again or there's something wrong in your life. If God is not adding to you daily riches and riches and health and healing and all that junk that they try to sell to everybody, they want you to believe they want you to believe that God does this to you every single day. And if it's not happening, well, it's got to be your fault. It's your fault. You won't let God do something. You won't let God heal you. You won't let God. You don't have enough faith in God for him to bring you blessing after blessing. And they put a guilt trip on you. And that, that with that guilt trip, they've got their hand out. And they say, now, sow a seed. In our ministry, and I promise God will give it back to you tenfold. You're an idiot if you sent them money. Whoops. Hey, I can't call you a fool. Okay, I'll just tell you, you weren't very smart for sending them money. Because that works for them every day. But it's not going to work for you. But God did promise... That he, you would be like a tree bringing forth fruit in season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now, what you've just seen here is God's cycle once again. Had God not showed me that, I, I might have left the ministry. I might have. And there's been times when I thought about it. But it was during those times that I didn't immediately recognize, Mike, it's winter time. What happens to all the trees and everything like that in winter time? They hibernate. They don't produce leaves. In fact, they lose all their leaves. They don't produce buds. They don't flower. They don't bring forth acorns or pecans or any kind of seed they don't they don't produce anything like that um, same way with with any kind of animal animals have cycles and seasons that they go in uh, just like humans do uh, and when you stop and think about God's creation this the sun has a cycle the moon has a cycle uh, the earth has a cycle. In fact, the entire universe does. 
And uh, because every month, if you go out at night and look straight up, there's going to be a different group of stars than there was last month. And, and God is doing that to show us that everything in life, even ladies, you have a cycle that God put you in that for, this is the miracle of God, but it matches the, the lunar cycle of waxing and waning. God did that on purpose to let some people know that, no, we didn't just evolve, we were created. And because we were created by God, then he put into our lives seasons okay so what i'm going to do over the next few messages is i'm going to today i'm going to lay the the foundation for it uh i'm going to teach you those cycles and how they work number one how they work in your personal life number two how we can expect them to work in others lives people that we're trying to witness to Sometimes we'll witness to somebody and we will think that because we didn't get immediate results that it didn't work. But how many of you know somebody that you witnessed to at one time and they didn't yield to the Lord right then, but sometime later they came to the Lord and it was based in part, in, at least in part, on something that you did or said for them. How many of you know somebody like that? I promise you, that not everybody that you witness to is going to just drop and get saved right then and there. It may not, when we put a seed in the ground, we don't just sit over it and go. In fact, yesterday we were dealing with those cicadas. I lived, they were literally climbing all over us. About every five minutes I'm going, get off of me. Old nasty, red, bald-eyed cicadas. Things are evil. The very fact that we're dealing with them this year. We have the seven year cicadas and the 13 year cicadas all coming out at the same year. Last time that happened was like in the 1800s. Okay, that's how far back that goes. But they go in cycles. And I asked the question yesterday. How is it that these bugs who are burrowed underground... How do they know the passing of seven years? How do they know that? Do they have a watch and a calendar? Do they have, a, do they have a, like an eye watch? Huh? It's built in. Who built it? Not according to the evolutionists. They say nature built it. But they don't know who nature is. Judges chapter 2. Are you there? Say amen. I remembered, and I'm just going to take you on the journey that God took me on. I remembered that the children of Israel in the book of Judges, they were, for a while they would be serving God. And everything would be fine. But then after a while, when they got wealthy and they got full of pride... They turned their back on God. They didn't, they didn't pray no more. They didn't need anything. They weren't starving to death. And no enemy was coming against them. So they, they just left God out of the picture. And before too long, they got so full of pride that they actually started praying to other gods, Baal and Ashtaroth. And then, because of that, God sent in cruel authority. And he would send the Moabites or... Any, any of the nations around them to come in, they would take them captive. And they would rule over them for 14 years, 40 years, different times. And that, that represented cruel authority being in charge of them. And when they finally got tired of it and didn't want to live that way anymore, they cried unto the Lord. God heard them. God sent a Savior Barak or Gideon or even Deborah uh, or um, uh, even Samuel. He was one of the judges, but God would send a savior to Israel. He would save them from the tyranny that they were under. They would turn back to God. God would bless them and the cycle would start all over again. Judges chapter 2 verse 11. 
And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed after other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers. Spoilers are those who take everything you've got. And spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about. So that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. That means God takes away your ability to say no to sin. Sin's your enemy. Death is your enemy. And God takes away their power to fight against and to stand against their enemies. So that they could not any longer stand before them. Verse 15, whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. I want to ask you a question this morning. I think I already know the answer. <clears throat> if some enemy nation, let's say China or Russia, were to launch an attack on the home soil of the United States of America, would we as a nation have any power whatsoever to stand against them and to flush those enemies out of our country and win the war? I don't think so, not now. I guarantee you on every college campus in America, let's say, let's say, the, um, let's say that Iran targeted the United States, sent missiles over, nuclear missiles, over to the United States and started a war. And we decided to go out against them and fight them. I guarantee you on the college campuses of this country, you would have people marching in favor of Iran provoked by their professors, paid for by George Soros and others. Because our way of life and our strength and our ability, uh, no nation would dare ever think to do that. But I guarantee you, if God provoked them to do it, they would do it. And we wouldn't stand a chance in this nation. God just wouldn't let us win. He's not going to bless the iniquity that is in this land. Amen. Amen. And that's what happened to Israel. They had no ability to stand against their enemies whatsoever. And the Lord swore unto them and they were greatly distressed. Now, verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Who, who remembers 9-11 that day? Who remembers that day? There was a call from every pulpit, every preacher that was worth anything for America to repent. 
America needed to repent. America needed to turn her heart back to God. America needed to get rid of its drugs and its pornography and everything else and our alternative lifestyles. We need to get rid of that junk. We need to serve God in this nation. There was a call from the preachers to do just that in this country. Did we do it? No, we're just like Israel. We turned our back on God once again. And now I wonder what the next worst thing is going to be that God will allow to take place on the shores of this nation or maybe in the heart of this nation. Giving our nation another chance to serve God. But will they take it? Probably not. I think it's very possible, I don't know this for 100%, but I think it's very possible that our nation could end up in bondage to our enemies. God did it with Israel. They were his people, his favorite people. You think God would hesitate to do it to us? Not likely. Now look at Judges chapter 3. Again, I'm just establishing the foundation for you this morning of where we're going to go the next few Sundays. I know some of you have heard this before from me. Some of you haven't. Uh, and I, but I think it's important. I, I've had this on my mind all week. It just seemed like that's what God would have me to preach. I prayed about it. Uh, spent some time with the Lord. Told him he could change it if he wanted to. So far he hasn't. If he does between now and next Sunday, I'll of course, I'll change this message. I'll do what God tells me to do. But I, th I think that it helps all of us to either be reminded of this or to learn this and to know that there are going to be times when you don't pray. You don't feel like praying. There's going to come times when you'll read the Bible. Don't get anything out of it. And probably you won't even read it. But then there will come a time when God who is faithful to us, is he not? He will return back to us what the spoilers took away. And, I, and, and that's, I, listen, I'm just telling you, that's how my life has gone. Judges chapter 3 verse 1. I want you to pay close attention to this first verse. Now these are the nations which the Lord left. In the book of Joshua, God specifically told Joshua, all of those nations, I want them all destroyed. I don't want one of them left. Do not spare young or old. Don't spare anything that's theirs. I want it all destroyed. But did, uh, did Joshua do that? He left them. We find out now that there was a reason why God allowed him to leave some of those enemies inside the borders. And here it, it almost makes me think of why is God allowing all of these people to come in our borders if God is allowing it do you think that God has a purpose for it so these are the nations which the Lord left and here it is to prove Israel by them I'm gonna do something this morning if you are born again you know beyond any doubt that you're going to heaven when you die and um, you know that you're on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. His blood has covered your sins. I'd like for you to raise your hand this morning and testify to that. Very good. Is it possible that somebody's lying? It's possible. We wouldn't know just to look at you. Unless, of course, you went and tattooed a pentagram on your forehead uh, we wouldn't know to look at you you raised your hand you could be lying through your teeth 
So what does God do? He says, um, to, the Lord left them to prove Israel. Some people, I've learned this in all my years in this same church. Some people who come to church, they're not really right. They play the game well. But after a while, they just get to where they can't stand being in church anymore. And they buzz out. They quit. They give up. Why? Got too hot for them. Got too difficult. They decided that that wasn't how they pictured Christianity to be. And so they leave. They're gone. And it's unlikely they'll ever come back. I've seen it happen over and over again. I've seen it as a child. I've seen it happen as an adult. I've seen it happen while I was the pastor. And more than likely, it'll happen again with somebody. But it's God is the one who proves them. I don't need to pry into their life. I don't need to know what it is they do outside of these walls. I don't, it's none of my business. But I guarantee you, God will prove you. And if you, are, if you are truly right with God, God will maintain you. God will keep you. But if you're just playing Sunday games with God, I promise you, He's going to send some enemies along to prove you. And then it'll be known whether or not you really are God's or not. In other words, you belong to God. So, only, verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at least such as before knew nothing thereof. Notice this, to teach them war. How many, how many men in here have actually fought a war? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Fought a war. I didn't. Not a, not a physical one. I fought some spiritual ones. And those were tough. But this generation of American, not only does it not know how to fight a war, they're not even anywhere near soldier material. I know we're not supposed to judge on appearance, but when I see a guy at Starbucks... About 24 years old, he's wearing his pajamas. He hasn't combed his old nasty orange green hair. And you can just sort of tell that all he cares about is watching stuff online. Having somebody else pay his bills for him while he sits around smoking dope, laying with other women or men, and he cares nothing about wanting to be a man, much less a godly man. I know we're not supposed to judge, but some people just look sketchy. Amen? So anyway, we have the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians. And the, by the way, I saw that guy the other day. I just thought I'd tell you. I wasn't making that up. And the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon under the entering in of Hamath. And they were there to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Now I'm going to say this and we're going to leave. I, I already know some men in this church that the enemy has reared its ugly head in your life and God was using that to prove you on whether you would serve God or be a servant to sin. Because everybody's got to make that choice. Everybody sitting in this room 
will make that choice at least once in your life. Whether you're going to serve sin for the rest of your life or you're going to serve God. And it's as simple as your sins get manifested. Did you know that? Surely be sure your sin will find you out. For there's nothing hidden that shall not be revealed. You know, those verses in the Bible that make us sweat and we go, oh no, I can't. I hope nobody finds out about my sin. Well, when people start finding out and it confronts you face to face, you can either choose to just give up, go after the sin, live a sinful lifestyle because you think there's no way that you can stop, no way you can quit, you're just going to keep doing it, or you can see it as God is refining you, God is working a work in you, God is proving what you've got in you. And if you really, really want to be in heaven for eternity, you will let God do His work in your life and God will show you how sin can be destroyed. Amen. But it's all about proving, not your works, your faith. Do you really trust God? And is this the life that you want to live? Let's stand to our feet.